Well, hey, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Julie. I'm one of the pastors here at Resurrection City Church. I uh, just want to say welcome. Thanks for coming. Thanks for putting up with our uh, last minute technical difficulties. Uh, we're so glad that you're here, especially if you're new, if you're just visiting with us. Um, we're just glad that you're able to worship God with us this morning. So if you are just joining us, uh, we have been in a series on 1 Corinthians. Uh, we've kind of just been going through the book, and the series has been called Becoming Who We Are. So we've really been looking at how God has made us holy. He's given us a new identity uh, at, through Jesus. And so how can we live that out in our daily lives? Uh, and today, I'm actually just, I'm just the opening act. I'm just here to tee up. We're going to have um, Andrea come up uh, eventually, and she's going to be uh, kind of preaching a little bit more on the topic. Um, but if you don't know Andrea, she is actually going to be our first missionary that is ever sent out of Resurrection State Church. Yes, we are very excited about that. Yes. So uh, we're really excited to support her and to remain as a home base for her as she um, gets ready to leave and then in the fall uh, gets ready to actually go to Thailand. So we'll have a big commissioning service then, so make sure that you're, uh, you're here for that. But uh, I'm going to pray for us, and then I'm going to just tee us up. I'm just going to read the chapter, kind of talk about the big picture of what's going on, and then I'll invite Andrea up. So please pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us your word. Uh, for speaking to us through it. Um, Lord, we pray that as we approach your word, as we come to scripture, that you would just help us to have open hearts, that we could hear what you have to say to us, um, and that we would uh, be have the courage to um, really listen to the Holy Spirit, that you might be moving in us, and to take steps and, and leave here changed. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Okay, so I'm actually going to read the entirety of chapter 7 this morning, uh, which is a little on the long side. But when the Corinthians were interacting with this, way back when it was first written, they would have mainly interacted with it by having it read to them. Okay, all 16 chapters. So I think we can handle one chapter, right? I believe in us. I think we can do it. Um, so if you, because the slides are not working, uh, if you want to get out your phone or if you have your Bible with you, uh, we're going to be doing 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So if you want to follow along, otherwise you can put your listening cap on and uh, really focus and, and listen to what I'm saying. And I want to give you something to focus on while you listen. Uh, so I want you to think of it a little bit like those um, reading comprehension tests that you might have had when you were uh, in school or maybe when you took like the ACT or something, if you did that. Uh, where they give you a kind of a section of something, some story or whatever, and then at the end, they kind of want you to, to summarize it or to, to talk about the big points of uh, the story. So I want you to do that. I want you to think about, after I finish reading this, how you would summarize this chapter. What's kind of the big idea behind it, okay? So we're going to start. First Corinthians chapter 7. Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual, sexual relations with a woman, but since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife, and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, one has another. Now to the unmarried and the widows, I say it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married I give this command, not I but the Lord, a wife must not separate from her husband, but if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and a husband must not divorce his wife. To the rest I say this, I, not the Lord. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. 
But if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or the sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. This is the rule I lay down in all churches. Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not become circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. Each person should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although if you can gain your freedom, do so. For the one who was a slave, when called to faith in the Lord, is the Lord's freed person. Similarly, the one who was free when called is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of human beings. Brothers and sisters, each person, as responsible to God, should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. Now about virgins. I have no command from the Lord, but I give a judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. Because of the present crisis, I think that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you pledged to a woman? Do not seek to be released. Are you free from such a commitment? Do not look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned, and if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. For those who marry will face many troubles in this life, and I want to spare you this. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. Those who mourn as they, if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. For the world in its present form is passing away. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is, considered, is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. Am I saying this for your own good? I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. If anyone is worried that he might not be acting honorably toward the virgin he is engaged to, and if his passions are too strong and he feels he ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He is not sinning. They should get married. But the man who has settled the matter in his own mind, who is under no compulsion but has control over his own will, and who has made up his mind not to marry the virgin, this man also does the right thing. So then he who marries the virgin does right, but he who does not marry her does better. A woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes. But he must belong to the Lord. In my judgment, she is happier if she stays as she is, and I think that I too have the Spirit of God. Whew, okay, we made it. Uh, this is long. Normally we don't do this, uh, but I the reason I wanted to read the whole thing is because I think there's a lot of little pieces in there that can sound like they might trip us up. Um, and if you were here a few weeks ago, Joel used the analogy of like being on a bike. And if you slow down too much, you might just kind of fall right off. But if you keep some momentum through it, even as you're focusing on the details, you can kind of remember the bigger picture of what the scripture might be saying. So if I were to pick, right, I asked you to think about it, so hold whatever you thought your big idea of the summary is in your mind. Um, but if I were to kind of summarize it, I would pick Paul's, uh, what he says in verse 17. So he says, nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them, just as God has called them. So basically, in this passage, he's saying, you learned about who Jesus was. You believed in him and the power of his life and his death and resurrection to make you holy, to set you free. You've been given a new identity based on what Jesus has done for us. And all of that happened within a social setting. What I mean by that is just whatever circumstances you find yourself in, right? When you chose to follow Jesus, maybe you were married, maybe you were a slave, maybe you were circumcised. But he's saying whatever setting you were in, it doesn't matter because those things don't define you anymore. Jesus does. So the big idea, I would say, is that your identity is not in whatever social setting you find yourself in, but your identity is in Christ. And he's not saying that you can't ever change your social setting, but he's saying even if you do, even if you go from being you know, single to married or married to divorced, whatever happens, 
ultimately those changes in status aren't going to change who you are. At least they shouldn't, because our identity is, should be fully grounded in Jesus. Right? Jesus' forgiveness and new life is ultimately where we find our identity, not our current circumstances. And if you're thinking, wait a minute, this sounds exactly like something else that I'm having deja vu. I feel like Julie has said this before. It's because I have. Paul's making the same point kind of throughout the letter. So he talked about this in chapter one uh, when he was talking about the influencers and this desire for wisdom and power and saying, you don't need those things (laughs) because your identity comes from Christ. Uh, And like I said, it's important if you go back and read through this passage, this chapter later, it's important to keep that in mind because you're going to run into some passages that might be kind of sticky and having that main idea kind of kind of help you. So, for example, he talks uh, in verse 21, says, were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you, although if you can gain your freedom, do so. And it's not that Paul's pro-slavery. He's just telling them that whether you're a slave or not, that's not the most important part about who you are. He says, if you can get your freedom, take it. But that ultimately, your real freedom comes from Christ. So if you do desire a change in your social setting, maybe you desire to get married or you desire to have kids or you desire to have a different job or live in a different city, whatever it is, that's fine. But don't let that desire for these other things outpace your desire for Jesus himself. Because no change in your social setting is ever going to satisfy you the way that Jesus will. And one of the situations that Paul talks about in this chapter is that change between marriage and singleness. And it's an important one, I think, for us to all talk about. And so for the rest of this message, I'm actually going to invite Andrea to come up, and she's going to be talking specifically about singleness. So like I said, if you don't know Andrea, she has been at Red City for a long time, and she is going to be going to Thailand in the fall as our first missionary. We're very excited. Um, And I just want to say I've been so encouraged by how all of you have really stepped in and supported her both financially and emotionally and just being there for her as she prepares for this. So I hope that you will um, support her today by listening to her and really taking what she has to say to heart. So thanks, Andrea. Thanks, Julie. Morning, everyone. It's good to be here. Um, I'm excited today to talk to you about singleness. We talk a lot about marriage, and we've talked a lot about uh, marriage and sex and what that means for us as a church throughout the series, but today we're going to kind of see the other side of the coin. So um, let's get started. I want to start with a quote that maybe some of you will recognize. It's a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Anyone recognize where that's from? Yeah, Pride and Prejudice. (laughs) Um, While Jane Austen might have written those words more than 200 years ago, they remain really as pervasive as ever, not just because it's the opening line to one of my most beloved uh, novels of all time, but it's still the prevailing message that society holds towards singleness today. Uh, Contrary to what Paul shares with the Corinthians in chapter 7, I think by and large people would agree that we mostly consider singleness or being single as a state that is undesirable. Modern views of singleness have been poorly handled, quite frankly, by both people in the secular world and in mainstream Christian society. In his book, Everybody's Story, Six Myths About Sex and the Gospel Truth About Marriage and Singleness, author Branson Parler outlines two stories that many of us have been told about sex and relationships. There's the secular story of liberty, and it contains myths such as individualism, like you do you, Uh, the supremacy of romance, that you need someone to complete you, and naturalism, that your body is matter in motion, or maybe if you've heard Joel say, your body is a meat suit. In this story, uh, without the guidelines for sex within the covenant of marriage, there's actually no problem with singleness. In fact, the authors of this secular story might agree with the surface-level meaning of Paul's message that it's preferable to be single because of the freedom it allows you. In this secular story, to be single and unencumbered, to freely enjoy whatever life throws at you, sexual opportunities or otherwise, is really good. But to be single and hold the traditional Christian view of sex within marriage is ghastly. Because if you don't even enjoy the advantages for pleasure that singleness holds, then you're wasting your life as sexually unfulfilled, romantically undesired, and therefore unable to fully express your identity as a human being. But then on the other side of the story, as Parler notes, uh, there's the church story of authority, 
and it contains myths of legalism, like you better behave yourself, sexual prosperity, that within marriage you can have your best sex life now, and um, evil bodies, that uh, you're not your body. In this church story of authority, marriage holds a really treasured position as the ultimate good. I don't know, maybe it's because we've taken verses like Proverbs 18.22 that says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing, um, and we twist it around and manipulate it out of proportion to offer the idea that to find a wife or a husband is not just a good thing, but the good thing to pursue in life. If we hold that to be true, then to be single, especially if you're single by your own choice, must be a sign of immaturity, of laziness, or maybe you've got some other intrinsic deficiency. There's something wrong with you if you can't figure out how to get on board with marriage. Oh, and in this church story, it's also not good to be single because that means you're not allowed to have sex. And much like their secular counterparts, a fulfilling sex life ranks pretty high on the list of what is necessary for a good life in the church story. Perhaps we could say in this story, it's a truth universally acknowledged that all good Christians are supposed to and will eventually get married so that they can have sex and lead a good life. Preferably the sooner the better. In both of these stories, I think we see singleness put on display in light of what it is not. Single equals not married. Single equals lack of sex, lack of purpose, lack of family, lack of value. And to be quite honest, in the church story, there are some people who might even contend that single equals lack of opportunities to grow in holiness. What this leaves us then um, with then is not just a high view of marriage, which is good. Please hear me. I'm not here today to tell you that marriage is terrible and you should all regret that you ever got married. Um, but So when we have this high view of marriage, which is good, in these two stories, we have a low view of singleness, which I think is not good. Like Julie mentioned earlier, and as we've heard throughout this series on 1 Corinthians, we've been talking a lot about our holy identity as individual believers and as a body of believers. I think we have an identity crisis when our view of marriage is so good and so lofty that it casts a shadow in which the gospel and the kingdom of God no longer sound like good news for single people. It certainly doesn't make sense with what Paul says to the Corinthians in verse 8, that it's good for unmarried Christians to remain unmarried. Why would he say that if being unmarried means that you lack the best things in life? Or even that by being single, you're barred from a common way to grow in holiness. I don't think it has to be this way. What I'm proposing today is that it is good and righteous to uphold a high view of marriage and that it is good and righteous to uphold a high view of singleness. I want to remind us that the gospel is good news for single people because of who we are in Christ, recipients of the full measure of his grace. So today, I invite you to come along with me and explore how we can reimagine our view of singleness in the light of becoming who we are as holy imitators of Christ. Now, I recognize that the group of people I'm speaking to, uh, statistically speaking, by and large, are uh, not single, that a lot of you are married. And you may be wondering, okay, Andrea, cool, that's fine, but why should I care about how I think about singleness when I'm not single and that doesn't have a direct application to my life? Well, I think there's lots of reasons why you should care, um, but I'll just leave you with two. The first one is that I think it's really good for the whole church to have a firm grasp on this. Um, in preparing for this sermon, I've learned so much from pastor and author Sam Albury. He wrote a book called The Seven Myths of Singleness, which I would highly recommend all of you read uh, after this sermon today if you're interested in digging deeper into some of these ideas that I'll talk about. But in that book, one of his main thesis statements is that while marriage shows us the shape of the gospel, Singleness shows us its sufficiency. It's really helpful and important for single Christians to understand the symbolism and importance of marriage. And so I love listening to sermons about marriage, even though it's not a state of life that I'm in, and I don't know if I'll ever be there. But it's equally helpful and important for married Christians to understand the symbolism and importance of singleness. And so I hope that you can take something from this message today, even if you can't find an immediate and direct application. And the second reason why I think you should care is that you know and love single people. We're present here in this body, and you have other friends, coworkers, relatives who are single. And cultivating a high view of singleness to kind of counteract the two stories that we talked about at the beginning cannot just fall on the shoulders of single people. We can't be our own like hype man. We need the whole church to do this with us. 
We need the whole church to think about and deeply understand the roles of marriage and singleness if we're truly to love each other well and live out our faith together in community. So now I'm really going to dive in. Um, Sounded like a lot of you were familiar with Pride and Prejudice, at least the opening line, but if you're not familiar with the whole story, um, it's set in Regency, England, and it stars a family that has five single daughters whose mother's very purpose for existing is to find them all rich husbands and a comfortable life. So when I think about Mrs. Bennett, I really wonder what her reaction to verses 6 and 7 might be. My guess is that it's probably not too far off from how many people today actually react to it. Uh, what are you talking about, Paul? In verses 6 through 7, he said, I say this as a concession, not as a command. So this is just kind of Paul's advice. He's not necessarily saying this is coming directly from God. Um, But he says, I wish everyone were single just as I am. Yet each person has a special gift from God of one kind or another. So as I mentioned before, singleness is too often defined by what it is not. Um, But it's it's a lack of a spouse and a partner having a lack of sex, lack of intimacy, lack of family, lack of purpose. Uh, So I just wanted to kind of take a quick pulse. Does this sound like a good gift? Lack of purpose, lack of family, lack of value. Is that something you want? You going to sign up for that? You going to put that on your registry? No, you're not. So what on earth does Paul mean by calling it a gift? And why would he wish that everyone were single just like he was? Um, There's been a lot of talk throughout church history in trying to understand and make sense of what's going on here. Um, And in preparation for this sermon, I also discovered scholar Dr. Dani Treweek. She has um, her PhD in developing a theology of singleness, and she's recently published a book called The Meaning of Singleness. If you've read um, Tim Keller's book, The Meaning of Marriage, it's kind of a parallel companion piece kind of a thing. Um, But in some of her work, she sought to trace the understanding of the word gift, as Paul used it in verse 7. Now, the Greek word here is charisma. It's the same word that Paul uses when he talks about spiritual gifts later on in the book and elsewhere throughout the New Testament. And according to Dr. Trowick, um, if we go back to the days of the Protestant Reformation, we have what is still today a widely accepted understanding of the, quote, gift of singleness, that it's a special calling for a select few people who will be able, by the grace of God, to withstand the difficulty and temptations of singleness, to which the vast majority of believers will and should should turn to marriage as the solution. I'm going to be real with you. This understanding of the gift of singleness has been really hard for me to grapple with as a single person. Um, And many of my single friends who I've talked to have shared similar sentiments. Um, What do we do if we think we have the gift of singleness, but yet we still really desire marriage and sexual expression? It's led in my own life to a lot of self-deprecation and self-doubt. Single people in this situation may question, oh my gosh, do I have the gift? I don't understand. I earnestly desire marriage. I really want to be with someone, um, but, I, but I, I'm single, so I don't understand. Do I have this gift? Or I have a lot of pent-up sexual desire. I'm really struggling with resisting temptation. So I don't think I have this gift because God hasn't been answering my prayers for a spouse. Or maybe even, I really wish this gift came with a gift receipt because I would love to return it, but unfortunately it doesn't. Um, So what are we supposed to do with our singleness if we have this view of it as a gift? It's really hard to be grateful for a gift that you'd rather not have, or even one that you're not sure if you do have. So in Dr. Troik's research, she went back even further in church history to look at some other ways that church fathers and mothers have looked at singleness and the gift language in 1 Corinthians 7. She found that according to St. Augustine, whose prayer we prayed earlier, the gift language of 1 Corinthians 7-7 refers to the grace of God in our lives at work in us by the Spirit, enabling any and all of us to righteously choose to use our sexuality to glorify him, love others, and dignify ourselves. In this sense, his understanding of the, quote, gift of singleness is markedly different from the, un- from the contemporary understanding, which sees it as something extraordinary. Above and beyond the ordinary grace of God, what an oxymoron, already at work in the lives of all believers. Now, I find myself agreeing with her, and if you don't, that's totally cool. There's plenty of room for nuance here. But for me, it's been so freeing and life-giving to understand singleness in this light. The gift of singleness is not a supernatural immunity to the desire for marriage or sex. So there's nothing wrong with you if you're single for longer than you wanted to be 
and you haven't figured out how to stop wanting to not be single. You haven't missed out on the gift because the gift is God's grace in our lives to choose righteousness. In this regard, all of us, married and single, by the charisma of God, can choose to use our sexuality to glorify God, love others, and dignify ourselves. And because of his grace, we lack nothing that we need to become who we are. In addition to this grace that we all have to pursue righteousness in all of our circumstances, I really believe that God also really generously takes care of single people by meeting our needs in ways that the secular story of liberty and the church story of authority don't always readily recognize. And to to talk more about that, I wanted to look to the life of Jesus to better understand how singleness is not as deficient as the stories we've been told make it out to be. So we're going to talk about some things that single people do not lack. First one we'll talk about is intimacy. While abstinence from sex does mean that single people don't experience a certain type of intimacy, this does not mean that we lack all forms of intimacy. I think it's a fallacy to assume that intimacy equals sex, and if we do, then of course it would seem to say that single people would lack intimacy. But in pursuing holy Christian singleness, we can develop a deep understanding and appreciation for intimacy in our friendships and the philia or brotherly sisterly love we have for one another. I myself have really enjoyed the intimacy of friendship through many of my relationships with people here at Res City. From the members of my community group to other people that I've met here, you've walked with me through some of my lowest lows and the highest highs of the past five years. And I've learned so much about God and life and love by being welcomed into your lives too. But even more importantly than this intimacy of friendship, as followers of Christ, we have access to deep intimacy and oneness with God himself. In his high priestly prayer in John chapter 17, Jesus prayed for his followers and for those of us who would believe in him through their words, which means you and me. And he said, I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe you sent me. What this means is that we are one with God through our faith in Jesus. And Paul emphasizes this too. In the previous chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 17, he wrote, the person who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So praise God that there is more to intimacy than a sexual relationship because single people, it's not something that you lack. Another thing that single people do not lack is the fullness of human experience. Remember how I said in the secular and in the church stories a fulfilling sex life was like, item number one on the list of what you need to have a full life? Well, throughout his earthly life, Jesus himself was single. And he did have a lot to say on upholding a high view of marriage and not entering into it lightly, but he himself never married, nor did he ever give it as a command or requirement for the men or women who followed him. He also says in John 10.10 that his purpose for coming to earth was to be the good shepherd and to give his sheep a rich and satisfying life. Now, I'm not trying to like equate Jesus' singleness and human singleness on the same level. He obviously did it perfectly, whereas humans are going to struggle with it in our sin. But um, it does show that it doesn't seem like Jesus has an expectation that marriage is essential to a rich and satisfying life. In other words, we can say that a rich and satisfying life doesn't stem from having a husband or a wife, but from a deep relationship with Jesus. And by no means does this diminish the beautiful role that marriage and children and families have in our lives and in the church. Those things do lead to a rich and satisfying life. But I think we should be careful not to overly inflate the role of marriage, children, and families and say that we must have them in our lives. With Jesus at the center of the story, a single life most certainly can be rich and satisfying. And the third thing that I don't think single people lack is family. Some people might say, well, what are single people supposed to do without a family? What about the love, support, and stability that comes from family life? Jesus has something to say about this too. In Matthew 12, 46 through 50, it says that as Jesus was speaking to the crowd, his mother and brothers stood outside asking to speak to him. Someone told Jesus, your mother and brothers are standing outside asking to speak with you. Jesus asked, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Then he pointed to his disciples and said, look, There's my mother and my brothers. Anyone who does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. 
In the kingdom of God, our true family is connected not only by flesh and blood, but through faith. Single Christians without a spouse and biological children are not without family because the church is our family. And I think the gospel is good news for single people when the whole church is living out its holy identity. Because in the church, we have a family who is united and called by the same spirit to love God and each other deeply. Because it is God's spirit who calls each and every one of us at a particular time in our lives, like Julie was saying, um, Paul advises that Christians can remain as they were when we received the call to know and follow Jesus. Now, again, like Julie said, it doesn't mean that we don't grow or we won't make changes to our lives in response to spiritual, emotional, and physical growth. But I think it does help us to think through what it might look like to desire a change and then pursue one, given Paul's re recommendations to remain as you are when you are called. First thing I think we need to think about here is what were we called to? Our calling is not first and foremost to marriage or singleness or slavery or freedom or to live in a particular country or to have a type of job or a certain lifestyle, but our calling is to God himself. So regardless of our relationship status, our socioeconomic status, our political affiliation, our job title, etc., etc., we are called to holiness and given a holy identity through faith in Jesus, not as a matter of our choices or our behaviors. Paul advises the Corinthians to remain as they were when they were called because those lesser order identifiers, which do carry heavy significance about who we are in the world, don't have equivalent standing in God's kingdom. So in God's kingdom, there is equality, but again, it's not anything about us or our own merit, but it's the equality of the identity given to us by God. Another important thing I want to uh, make clear here is that marriage or singleness in themselves don't make us holy. So a person's singleness is not a punishment from God. They're not being put on probation and to later be rewarded with marriage when they finally figured it all out and gotten rid of all their sin issues. And on the same hand, marriage is not a promised reward of discipleship, of faithfulness, nor is it a sign that you've already figured out all of your sin issues. This means that it's possible for Christians to live out our holy identity and calling in whatever station of life we find ourselves in, uh, the same one that we were in when God called us. We are free to desire, pursue, and obtain a change in status, like when Paul tells slaves, if you can find your freedom, go ahead and take it. Um, but because these things are not what defines us, we don't have to live or die by them. We can keep the desire in eternal perspective. So then, if you're married, if you were married when you were called or you find yourself married now, your job is to figure out how do you live out your holy identity as a married person, both within your marital relationship and also how you relate to the outside world. And if you're single now and you were single when you were called, our job is to figure out how we live out this holy identity as a single, both alone and with others. I want to pause here to make a really important point that um, this has to go beyond thinking about how you have a holy sexuality. Uh, sex has been covered pretty robustly in these past few weeks in the beginning of this chapter, and even in the beginning of this message, and it is a really important thing for us to think about and to steward well as Christians. But there are lots of other ways that you can live a holy, set-apart life in this world um, to follow along with your holy identity. So in your marriage or in your singleness, in your status as a student or in your promotion at your job or whatever you find yourself in, I would encourage you to think, how does viewing yourself as a holy member of God's family affect your financial decisions? How you take care of your physical, mental, and emotional health? How do you spend your leisure time? How do you relate to your boss or people who are supervising you? And in turn, how do you relate to people who are under your supervision? How do you uh, have a commitment to the community where you live? And how do you steward the resources that God's given you on this earth? Your holy identity can and should permeate everything about you and not the other way around. Branson Parler, the author I mentioned at the beginning, um, I think he has a great quote in his book that has really helped me to think about this. He says that our calling is to put a question mark next to the stories of our secular age through our strange way of life and our readiness to explain how that life stems from the gospel and Jesus. In the foolish wisdom of God that Paul wrote about in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we have an opportunity to use whatever status we find ourselves in to point to Jesus. I want to very clearly state here that there is a dignity and a purpose to singleness that extends beyond the temporary imagination 
that singleness is for a season and that that season is to pr prepare yourself for marriage. Remember that quote I mentioned before from Sam Albury that singleness has the purpose of showing the sufficiency of Christ in the gospel? Single friends, I love this for us. Look, I know that it's weird to the outside world, to the secular world, that uh, any of us would choose to remain single, especially if I make that choice while still having a desire to be married, and that it may even look really weird to the church within the church story of authority too, but that's kind of the point. When Christians uphold the sanctity of their marriage covenant, it shows the world not only their serious commitment to each other, but also the serious commitment between Christ and his bride, which is the church. And when Christians uphold the sanctity of their singleness, it shows the world the power of God at work in us. If you've uh, been a regular attender of, of Red City for some time, I want you to stop and think for just a few seconds about some of the worship songs that are kind of in our repertoire. Think about how many of them talk about the sufficiency of Christ in our lives. I'll give you some examples. Um, I need thee every hour. You are the only one. Christ or else I die. Be thou my vision. These are really powerful songs. And singleness is a beautiful way of living that worship out loud. It tells the world and the church the truth that we have all we need in Christ. So my goal for this message today was that we as a group of believers would explore how the whole church can take up the task of cultivating a high view of singleness. It cannot fall on the shoulders of single people alone to see and declare the goodness of their lives and the role we play in the body of Christ. So here are just a few key takeaways from the last few verses of chapter 7 that I've been thinking about as uh, I try to develop my own high view of singleness and how we can cultivate a church-wide high view of singleness and maintain a church-wide high view of marriage. So in verses 32 through 40, Paul kind of talks about how like the married people are going to be distracted. Um, they've got earthly responsibilities they have to think about, but a single man or single woman can be fully devoted to the Lord. And what I think we can take away from this here is that we need to redeem the myth that a single life is an unfulfilled life. I think it's important for everyone to acknowledge that marriage and family life is not the ultimate good that we should pursue, and that if we pursue it, it shouldn't be done lightly. There is a high value on marriage because of the great responsibility that it requires. And it is possible and good to pursue holiness in marriage, but being in a relationship comes with additional responsibilities that can distract and interrupt dedication to God. And it's not a bad thing to focus on your spouse or your kids, but the reality is that takes up mental and emotional energy. Singleness, on the other hand, offers the opportunity to be fully devoted and set apart in our pursuit of Christ. Holy Christian singleness is not merely a training ground for marriage, nor is it a crucible of testing your ability to resist temptation, but has intrinsic value as a way of life that is marked by love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, goodness, and self-control. So some practical ways that I think we can cultivate this high view of singleness in real life and love singles well. For starters, all of us would do well to remember our holy identity and its source, Jesus. For married people, here are some things, just a couple of ideas that you might want to consider. Um, think about how you can honor the single people in your life. How can you affirm their holy identity, their dignity, their place in God's family? You might even consider how can you give them a place in your family. Um, I know I've been blessed by invitations to join families here at Red City for holidays, uh, for weekend outings. I've experienced the hospitality of being able to stay in your homes and enjoy your friendship over a meal. And that has really come in clutch in some really hard times. And I don't even think that um, those of you who've extended those invitations to me even realize how important it was for me to be in community at those times. So I want to say thank you publicly for reaching out and including me in your families and encourage you to do the same for others. The second thing that I think married people can consider doing is uh, think about your role in cultivating spaces where single people can belong just as fully as married people. An example of this is think about how you can help to steer conversation topics when you're in a mixed group so that everyone can engage. I'm not saying you should never talk about your marriage or your kids. Um, because your single friends love you and love your kids and love your family. And we care about you. We want to know what's going on in your life. We want to know how we can walk with you and support you in those ways. But it's also really hard for us to engage as deeply when we don't have something equal to talk about. 
So um, be conscious of the conversation topics and, and the weight and the amount of time that's being given um, and be inclusive when possible. I would also encourage you to seek out wisdom and insight from single people. Um, they may not be married and may not be able to offer you specific advice about marriage issues, but there's a lot of life to live and there's a lot more going on in your life than just what's going on in your marriage and I would encourage you to um, honor and affirm them by seeking out their wisdom. And just one last recommendation, although this is not an exhaustive list of what you can do, is pray with and for the single people that you know. I would caution you, though, to ask them what they need in their current uh, situation of singleness. Maybe they're really interested and hopeful in marriage, and so they're pursuing dating, whether online dating or asking to be set up or, you know, whatever way, and that's great, and maybe you can pray for them in that. Or maybe they're in a time in their singleness when they just really need strength and encouragement to find contentment with where they're at and uh, to choose the gift of grace that God has given them to pursue righteousness in this season. Or quite honestly, maybe it's a little bit of both. I would say that's often where I find myself is straddling the line between like being really, really hopeful and trying to figure out if this is what I've got for life, God, how do I make the best of it? Ultimately, I would encourage you to get close enough with them that you can ask them these hard questions and they feel comfortable to be vulnerable and real with you to give an honest answer. And now for single people, I would encourage you to embrace your place in God's kingdom as one of many different and equally valuable members. You have something to offer to the family of God and um, I want you to feel encouraged and welcome to express that to use your gifts to serve the church, to love others, to honor God and dignify yourself. Second piece of advice for single people is don't be afraid to initiate and build relationships with the people around you, even and maybe especially those whose life doesn't look like yours. I would encourage you to seek the wisdom and counsel of married friends and single friends too, but also don't forget that your life experience matters and you do have wisdom to offer your friends around you. And lastly, if you do desire marriage, and it hasn't happened for you yet, and especially when it feels like maybe it won't ever happen, I want you to remember that marriage is good, but not ultimate. God's not teasing you or dangling marriage in front of you like a proverbial carrot waiting for you to get your life together before he finally grants you the gift of a spouse. He loves you right now. 1 John 3, 1 says he lavishly loves you, and he does give good gifts to you. So you can trust that your singleness is good, and he will meet you with it in grace. And if you don't believe that, you can ask him to help you to believe it. So we're now going to enter into a time of communion and worship through song. And during this time, um, as um, the worship team comes up, I want to invite all of us to reflect on the significance of this meal. Communion is a beautiful historical church tradition that reminds us of the intimate fellowship and deep friendships that Jesus had when he shared the Last Supper with his disciples before he made his way to the cross. As we enjoy this symbolic meal together each week and today, let us not forget the intimate fellowship that we still get to have with Jesus some 2,000 years later. So please pray with me. Lord, thank you for the gift of grace that you give in full to all who put their trust in you. Thank you that in that grace, all of us are empowered to live out a holy identity as your sons and daughters. Help us to think with your wisdom in all aspects of our lives as we become who you have called us to be. I pray for single people who are looking to understand the meaning of singleness in the midst of fairly constant reminders that they are on the margins. May your church be a place where they find love and dignity and belonging. I pray for married people who are faced with divided attentions as they seek to live up to the high calling of marriage and the high calling of following you. Would you guide them as they uphold their commitments to each other and their families? And may your church be a place where they find love and dignity and belonging too. Thank you, Jesus, for your love and your example. We pray this in your name. Amen.